They were the closest European counterparts to the heroes and villains of the American Wild West. Rugged, even cowboy-like individuals fighting again and again for their freedom. You may picture them with boots and saddles and huge mustaches and hats, armed with sabers and rifles and sweeping across the steppe. I'm talking, of course, about the Cossacks. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode about the Cossacks. We've talked a lot about Tsar Nicholas, the last ruler of the Romanov dynasty. And now I'm going to talk about the first. Michael Romanov. He had support from the Cossacks that, after years of chaos, put him on the throne at Moscow. Later, he sent a representative south to Cossack lands to demand submission. And that representative was put into a sack and thrown into the River Don. And that was that. Back then, no matter how much Moscow tried to turn them from allies into subjects, the Cossacks refused, which caused a fair amount of trouble. But Moscow allowed them to keep any territory they conquered, like Siberia, as long as it was officially part of Russia. But who were these people, and where did they come from? Until the 1500s, there wasn't really any such thing as a Cossack. For a few hundred years, the Mongols under Genghis Khan and his successors had ruled the enormous open plains that stretched all the way from Hungary to China. But the Mongol expansion eventually stopped, and the empire of the Khan was divided up. The part that is now southern Russia was under control of a people called the Tatars. They were very warlike, and they lived by plunder, often raiding to the north as far as Moscow. They were pretty nasty even for the times, carrying off thousands of people to sell at the Ottoman slave markets. The Russians saw them as a true terror and their lands as simply barbaric domains. But by the 1500s, the Tsars were gaining in power and while doing so, were reducing the peasant population to the level of serfs, which is pretty close to being slavery. You can imagine that the peasants weren't so happy about this development, but what could they do? Well, they could submit, They could die, or they could run. And the only place to run was to the Tatar lands to the south. So again, as you can imagine, the only ones that made it there were the bravest, the strongest, or the most self-reliant of the Russian peasants. Now beyond Moscow's reach, they assimilated with the Tatars and eventually dominated them in some ways. So you had something totally new, a huge community of Orthodox Christian warrior horsemen of both Slavic and East Asian descent. These were the Cossacks, and they truly lived by the sword and were ruled by no man. They were unlike any other people in Europe, not exactly Russian, but not an entirely distinct tribe. Certainly not a military caste like the Junkers of Germany. For centuries, their homelands were a kind of melting pot open to anyone brave or desperate enough to enter. There is no better analogy than the gun-toting freebooters of the American West. The name, well, As far as I'm aware, nobody knows exactly where the name Cossacks came from, but they were a remarkable people. Unlike pretty much anyone else in the area, they were totally democratic. Everyone had a vote, including the women, and they elected an Ataman who served as leader for one year so that no one person could ever get too powerful. And anyone in the world who wanted to be a Cossack could be a Cossack. You just had to at least say that you accepted the Orthodox Church. Whatever race or ethnic group you were, didn't matter. There was no hereditary elite and all property was communal. And Moscow certainly enjoyed having them as a buffer between enemies further south or east. And they certainly helped Michael Romanov. But times change and Russia did want them as subjects. The 17th and 18th centuries saw Russian wars against the Cossacks and Cossack rebellions against the Russians. These ended in Cossack defeat, and they became part of the Russian Empire, and many of their traditions were diluted. The Ataman was now appointed by the Tsar. That was a big one. Some large and strong Cossack families took huge estates and began to live as traditional Russian aristocracy, and serfdom was introduced to Cossack lands. But some traditions won't die, and for the Cossacks, it was the warrior tradition. But keeping that came at a price. Cossacks owed the Tsar first 20 and then 30 years of military service, and they had to provide their own equipment and horses, which is a lot to ask from an ordinary family. 
And a big downside for pretty much everyone, the Cossacks' traditional contempt for outsiders eventually made them into the Tsar's instruments of repression and genocide. In 1648 and 1649, they massacred 300,000 Jews. For doing all of this, for their years of service, they got grants of land. I guess I just made them sound like murder robots, and that wasn't really the case, especially a couple hundred years down the line. In the abortive 1905 Russian Revolution, their service to the Tsar nearly broke down when there were Cossack mutinies against being used to crush the peasant workers' rebellion. The disloyal units were disbanded, and a crisis was averted. But when this war came, they were ready for service. All of them, boys, middle-aged men, you name it, they made up more than half of the Russian cavalry and had a fearsome reputation. Though, since the Russian high command sent them and their horses against German and Austrian machine guns, the war was worse for them than for most Russians. They died in droves. By 1917, when they were called upon once again to put down popular uprisings, many of them had had enough. They stood aside and allowed the revolution to proceed. Of all the signs that Nicholas II and his whole system were finished, this was the clearest. Though no one had been surprised that when Petrograd turned to chaos and the revolution began, it was Cossack horsemen who were called in to stop it and restore order. Russians had learned to expect to see Cossacks wherever there was trouble. In fact, often it was the Cossacks who were the trouble. They put the first Romanov on the throne, overran Siberia, and broke the back of Napoleon's forces. They were often the Tsar's enforcers, eventually becoming very much the scourge of the peasants and the Jews. They broke what the Romanovs needed breaking, and yet the great Tolstoy, who had lived among the Cossacks when he was young, said that what actually made a Cossack a Cossack was their love of freedom. And yet, ironically, they were the real symbol of the Tsar's oppression, the Cossacks. If you'd like to see an episode where the Cossacks went into action, you can click right here for one of those. Do not forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe either. See you next time.